This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 51. Coming up on Space Time. Solar storms trigger radio blackouts in Australia, linking the large cosmic web-like structure of the universe with stellar formation, and why Jupiter's moon Io has such splendid dunes. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A severe X1.1 class solar flare erupting from the surface of the sun has caused strong shortwave radio blackouts across Australia, the Western Pacific and Eastern Asia over the Easter holidays. Solar flares are powerful bursts of energy caused by the snapping of magnetic field lines emanating from pairs of sunspots on the solar surface. These solar flares were generated by a pair of sunspot groups, AR2993 and AR2994, which had been active for about a week before appearing over the eastern solar limb and then exploding directly towards the Earth. Imagery from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft showed the large sunspot group rotating into firing range of the Earth. Scientists classify solar flares as either C, M or X class, depending on their brightness in X-ray wavelengths, and these were among the most powerful. The solar flare activity had already triggered a coronal mass ejection on the far side of the Sun, blowing a huge bubble of magnetic field and solar material into space over several hours. These later solar storm events were among the most powerful so far since the start of the Sun's current 11-year solar cycle. The solar cycle will continue to escalate as the Sun moves towards solar max, the climax of the cycle when the Sun's magnetic poles will flip and change polarity. These space weather events can cause significant geomagnetic storm activity on Earth, including not just radio interference, but also navigation problems and power blackouts. In fact, it was a solar storm in 1989 which blacked out a significant portion of Quebec and also affected large areas of the northeast of the United States. Solar storms also affect spacecraft, shorting out electronics and expanding the Earth's atmosphere, causing increased drag and orbital decay, which means spacecraft need to use more fuel in order to maintain the correct orbital altitude. Using more fuel decreases a satellite's life. And the radiation produced by these solar storms is also harmful to astronauts in space and even people in high-altitude aircraft. On the other hand, solar storms do produce spectacular auroral activity, giving us the northern and southern lights, the aurora borealis and aurora australis, among the most spectacular of all celestial displays. This is Space Time. Still to come... Linking the large-scale cosmic web-like structure of the universe with stellar formation and why Jupiter's moon Io has such splendid dunes. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show now to talk about our sponsor, the I Am Bio podcast. Our future as a species and as a living planet is dependent on the fascinating world of biotechnology. And that's where the I Am Bio podcast comes in. This show brings you powerful stories of biotechnology breakthroughs straight from the experts themselves. You'll hear about everything from new vaccine technologies to Alzheimer's research, cutting-edge technologies and their impact on our planet, right through to ways to improve water supplies. The I Am Bio podcast helps you stay informed and up-to-date on all the latest advances in this rapidly growing field. Hosted by Dr. Michelle McMurray-Heath and experts in their fields, the I Am Bio podcast will help you gain a better understanding of this rapidly growing industry. And it's got something for everyone interested in biotechnology. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit their website at bio.org forward slash podcast. Whether you're a student, a scientist, or just plain curious, Michelle McMurray-Heath and colleagues will keep you informed and engaged every step of the way. 
the name of the podcast again, I Am Bio. Check it out. And of course, we'll include the website URL in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have identified cold streams of star-forming gas flowing into galaxies from the intergalactic medium. The new observations reported in the journal Nature Astronomy provide a link between the large-scale cosmic structure of the universe and the development of galaxies and stars within it. The cosmic web is made up of gigantic empty voids surrounded by long thin strands and filaments made up of galaxies and leading to connecting nodes comprising galaxy clusters and superclusters. But exactly how it all fits together and works has sometimes been a bit difficult to fully understand. We know galaxies grow by merging together to become larger galaxies, but they also grow by accumulating more and more gas from their surroundings and converting that into stars. But details of this process have remained murky. Now, new observations made using the Keck Cosmic Web Imager in Hawaii have provided the clearest, most direct evidence yet that filaments of cool gas spiral into young galaxies, supplying the fuel for making new stars. The study's lead author, Christopher Martin from Caltech, says that for the first time, scientists are seeing filaments of gas directly streaming into a galaxy like a pipeline going straight in. This pipeline of gas sustains star formation, explaining how galaxies can make stars on very fast timescales. See, for many years, astronomers have debated exactly how gas makes its way into the centre of galaxies. Does it heat up dramatically as it collides with surrounding gas? Or does it stream in along dense filaments, remaining relatively cold? Before this model came about, researchers had proposed that galaxies were simply pulling in gas and heating it up to extremely high temperatures. From there, the gas was thought to gradually cool down before providing a steady but slow supply of fuel for star formation. The problem is, this hypothesis was thrown into question when astronomers saw distant galaxies forming stars at really high rates much too fast to be accounted for by the slow settling and cooling of hot gas. See, the thing is, molecular gas clouds need to be cold in order to collapse under their own gravity to form stars. But providing evidence for the existence of these cold streams of gas has remained a major challenge until now. So, Martin and colleagues built the Keck Cosmic Web Imager and then attached it to the giant 10-metre Keck telescope specifically to answer that question. The Keck Cosmic Web Imager was designed and built at Caltech to provide a state-of-the-art spectral imaging camera. Called an Integral Field Unit Spectrograph, it allows astronomers to take images such that every pixel in the image contains a dispersed spectrum of light. Installed on Keck in 2017, it's the successor to the Cosmic Web Imager that's been operated at the Palomar Observatory in East San Diego since 2010. And this new instrument has eight times the spatial resolution and ten times the sensitivity. Understanding and characterizing the Cosmic Web was the main driver for building the new Imager. But this instrument is very flexible, and astronomers have used it, among other things, to study the nature of dark matter, to investigate black holes, and to refine science's understanding of star formation. Martin and colleagues used the Keck Cosmic Web Imager to acquire data on two active galaxies known as quasars, named UM287 and CSO38. Quasars are gigantic beams of matter and energy streaming out from the accretion disk surrounding feeding supermassive black holes. Near each of these two quasars is located a giant nebula larger than the Milky Way galaxy and visible thanks to the strong illumination from the quasars. By looking at light emitted by hydrogen in the nebulae, specifically an atomic emission line known as hydrogen lime at alpha, the authors were able to map the velocity of the gas. From previous observations at Palomar, the team already knew there were signs of rotation in the nebulae, but the new Keck data has revealed much more. The study's co-author, Danalo Sullivan, also from Caltech, says when they had previously used the Palomar Cosmic Web Imager, they were able to see what looked like a rotating disk of gas, but they couldn't make out any filaments. 
but the increased sensitivity and resolution of the Keck Cosmic Web Imager has provided far more sophisticated models, allowing the authors to see that these objects are being fed by gas flowing in from attached filaments, which is strong evidence that the Cosmic Web itself is connected to and fueling the disks. Martin and colleagues then developed a mathematical model to explain the velocities they were seeing in the gas and tested it on UM-287 and CSO-38, as well as on a simulated computer galaxy. Martin says it took over a year to come up with the right mathematical model to best explain the radial flow of the gas. But once they did, they were shocked by just how well the model works. This model is providing the best evidence yet for the cold flow model of galaxy formation, which basically states that cool gas can flow directly into forming galaxies where it's then converted into stars. My name is Donald O'Sullivan. I'm a graduate student at Caltech working with Chris Martin on the Keck Cosmic Web Imager and Palomar Cosmic Web Imager. When you look at the sky, you see billions and billions of galaxies. And I think a very natural question to ask is, how did they get there? Why do they have the kind of shapes and sizes and colors that they do? And in order to be able to answer that question, you need to understand the environment they came from and the environment that they're growing with. And that is the cosmic web. The cosmic web is the gas between galaxies, the intergalactic medium. And we nickname it the cosmic web because it's spread out in what looks kind of like a spider web filamentary structure. What we are trying to do is make maps of the cosmic web. With Palomar, we looked at this gas, you see like what looks like a disk, and you see that it's rotating, but our resolution was not great. Just enough to be able to say, we think that this is a giant disk of gas, 10 times the size of the Milky Way, and we think it's rotating. With KCWI, because of the increased sensitivity and the increased resolution, we were able to provide very strong evidence that we are directly observing filaments of gas connecting to this disk from the cosmic web and look at how they changed its velocities and how they changed its morphology. And this has been predicted in theory and simulations, but never yet observed. Working on instrumentation at Caltech, it's incredible because you're building new ways of looking at the universe, uh, which maybe weren't accessible before. This room is the synchrotron lab at Caltech where we assembled and tested the Keck Cosmic Web Imager here. It's a cool room to be in, especially for instrumentation. The five meter mirror for the Hale telescope at Palomar was polished here. And yeah, I, I did some work in this room. I built a small part of Keck Cosmic Web Imager. Working with Chris Martin, you really get trusted with serious responsibilities to build important things. We want to achieve two things with the Cosmic Web Imager. We want to be able to look at spectroscopy, meaning the color of the light. We also want to get a full 2D image. Hydrogen emits at very specific colors. Helium emits at very specific colors. So the way we identify gas is by atomic emission. So you get an image where at every pixel, you also get a spectrum of light. In every pixel you say, is there hydrogen here? And you can make a map of that gas. One thing I'm really looking forward to with the Keck Cosmic Web Imager is that we're going to be able to collect a large sample of observations like this where one or two case studies is nice. What's really great is to be able to look at, you know, tens or hundreds of objects and build up a big picture of how these processes work in the early universe and how galaxies form and evolve in a more statistical sense. That was the study's co-author, Donald O'Sullivan from Caltech. This is Space Time. Still to come, why Jupiter's moon Io is at splendid dunes and later in the science report, more grim warnings that bees are at risk of decline due to climate change. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have long wondered how Jupiter's volcanic moon Io can have such spectacular meandering ridges as grand as any seen in movies like Dune. Now, a new study reported in the journal Nature Communications has provided a new explanation of how dunes can form even on a surface like that of Io. 
The findings are based on a study of the physical processes controlling grain motion, coupled with an analysis of images from the 14-year mission of NASA's Galileo spacecraft, which allowed for the creation of the first detailed maps of Jupiter's Galilean moons. The new study is expected to expand science's understanding of the geological features of these planet-like worlds. The study's lead author, George MacDonald from Rutgers University, says his study suggests the possibility that Io is a new dune world. He's proposed and quantifiably tested a mechanism by which sand grains can move and in turn form dunes on Io. Now, current scientific understanding dictates that dunes, by their very nature, are hills or ridges of sand which are piled up by the wind. And scientists in previous studies of Io, while describing its surface as containing some dune-like features, conclude that the ridges couldn't be dunes, since the sort of forces generated by winds on Io would be really weak due to the Moon's low-density atmosphere. McDonald says his work explains how environments in which dunes are formed are considerably more varied than the classical endless desert landscapes on parts of Earth, or for that matter, on the fictional planet Arrakis in the movie Dune. The Galileo mission, which lasted from 1989 to 2003, logged so many scientific firsts, scientists are still to this day deciphering and studying the data it collected. One of the major insights gleaned from the data was the high extent of volcanic activity on Io, so much that its volcanoes repeatedly and rapidly resurfaced the entire world. Io's surface is a mix of black solidified lava flows and sand, flowing effusive lava streams and snows of sulfur dioxide. McDonald used mathematical equations to simulate the forces on a single grain of basalt or frost and then calculate its path. When lava flows into sulfur dioxide beneath the moon's surface, its venting is dense and fast-moving enough to move grains on Io and possibly enable the formation of large-scale features like dunes. Once McDonald devised a mechanism by which the dunes could form, he then looked for photos of Io's surface taken by Galileo for more proof. He says the spacing of the crest and the height-to-width ratios he observed were consistent with trends for dunes seen on Earth as well as those found on other planets. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 